That's what the Jews thought. That he's going to come and he's going to, you know, uh, drive out the Romans. Not drive out the people out of the temple. Not the Jews. He's going to drive the Romans out. And reestablish a David-like empire. That's what they all longed for. But if that would happen, everyone could see it. And that's why Jesus had to say, it's not going to come observably like you think. It's already here in your midst and you don't see it. It's not a political thing that's happening. And he, and he has to correct Nicodemus' wrong views here. You won't see it unless you're born again. Now, Nicodemus must have thought that was an amazing thing because he was probably of uh, very pure Jewish birth. Having risen to such a position of respect, generally speaking, having, having a, a perfect Jewish pedigree was something almost required if you're going to be highly respectable in the society. And, you know, one could hardly hope to have a higher and better birth than Nicodemus had had. The Jews thought that being born Jewish with pure Jewish blood a pure seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's what it took to be the kingdom of God. You had to be have the right bloodline and the right status in birth, which was basically Jewish. And if you had that, you're in. Israel, as far as they were concerned, is the kingdom of God. And when the kingdom is restored in the Messiah, if you're in Israel, you're in it. And very few people probably had a better pedigree than this Nicodemus had. And Jesus said, well, you've got to be born again if you're going to see it. And Nicodemus must have felt very strange about that. You know, well, how can you have a better birth than the one I already had? How, how could one be more qualified than I am by birth to seek and enter a kingdom? And he said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I've been reading the Bible all my life, and as a child, I was familiar with this story, of course. It's famous. And I remember reading it many times in my youth and thinking, this doesn't seem real. No one would ask such a stupid question as that. When you mention being born again, no one's going to say, oh, you mean go back into the womb and be born again? That, that's just not realistic. And then when I start witnessing to people and talking about being born again, I heard them ask that question many times. Uh, not in mockery, but just in, uh, you know, uh, incredulity. You know? Like, you know, what do you mean be born again? You know? can't go into a womb and be born again. That's, they literally thought that. Of course, now the term became much more popularized, uh, especially when Chuck Colson was born again and, uh, and wrote a book of the Testament called Born Again that made, got a lot of publicity. And then people like us became called born again. You know, people who aren't Christians, uh, they, they speak about evangelicals as born again. So it just became a popular term now. So I'm sure that now you wouldn't hear this kind of response as much. But back uh, before the term was well known outside of Christianity, you talked to an unbeliever, it's very common for someone to ask this very question. So this, this dialogue is very realistic. It's easy to believe it really happened. That's what many people used to think when they'd hear the term born again. And by the way, you probably have seen the bumper stickers. People say, I was born right the first time, you know, and, and basically saying, I don't need to be born again because my first birth was, you know, fine. Uh, obviously a, uh, a sarcastic and uh, sacrilegious slur on what Jesus said. I don't need to be born again. Well, maybe they won't be. They'll find out if they were born good enough the first time. I don't think so. Nicodemus wasn't, and he was about as good as they get in Israel. Israel were the chosen people. So, I mean, there wasn't really anyone better than Nicodemus to feel qualified. He was well born. He was well respected. He was in the Supreme Court. He had political power. He was religiously respected. He was a better teacher than anybody else of the Word of God. He had a career in it. He was a servant of God. How come he wasn't good enough? And if he wasn't, who could be? And he said, are you talking about going, like, into a womb and being born again? How could this happen? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this statement obviously is parallel to verse 3, but not verbatim the same. In verse 3, it says you have to be born again. 
In verse 5, he says you'll be born of water and the Spirit. If, uh, and in uh, verse 3, he says you cannot see the kingdom. In verse 5, he says you cannot enter the kingdom. But even though the words are different, he's still talking about the same phenomenon. Becoming aware of the kingdom of God and entering it requires uh, an additional birth. Now, he said you must be born of water and of the Spirit. And this phrase has been interpreted variously. I, uh, I never really encountered the interpretation uh, that sees this as a reference to water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism until I actually, when I was much younger, in a conversation with Mormons, found out that they believed, since they believe you have to be baptized in water and you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you say they use this verse. And I was conversing with them, I was, I was surprised that they could take it that way. I thought, it doesn't say anything about baptism. It says you have to be born of water and born of the Spirit. They said, well, that means baptized in water and baptized in water. I thought, boy, are those Mormons out to lunch. And then I found out it's a major view among theologians, <laughs> Christian theologians. Many theologians believe that Jesus is talking about baptism here. Um, that he's saying you have to be baptized in water and you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in order to be saved, to enter the kingdom. Well, if that's true, then a person who's not water baptized obviously cannot hope to be in the kingdom. And then the Church of Christ people are correct that you, you know that water baptism is essential for salvation. That's a, a view of the Church of Christ and also of, of a number of other groups. I don't believe the Bible indicates that that's true. Certainly baptism is important, but I don't see Jesus bringing that up here. I don't see anything in Jesus' words that would communicate the idea of baptism. Maybe the word water, you know, because you baptize water, but you also drink water, and you also bathe in water, and you also do a lot of other things with water. You water your garden with water. Just the mention of water doesn't necessarily convey the idea of baptism. He doesn't talk, he doesn't say anything about being baptized in water. He says being born of water. Now, um, I suppose baptism can be seen as a metaphor of birth, or in our case of rebirth, because we are we die and we're buried with Christ in baptism, and we kind of we rise to the newness of life out of the water. That's like you know coming to life from the dead. That's that's what regeneration. That's what rebirth really is. And so for us, after the resurrection of Christ, we are actually instructed to see our baptism as kind of a birth in a sense. I mean, at least an emblem of a new life, of burying the past and, and rising to a new life. Uh, although the word birth isn't used in the, in, the, in the epistles about that experience, yet the idea of a new life could be the idea of a birth. But they wouldn't have had that association in Jesus' day. That comes up after the resurrection of Christ. We're buried with him in baptism and raised with him. Uh, only after the resurrection could that idea be associated with baptism. John the Baptist was the one who was baptizing at this time, and he didn't say anything about being born again. He didn't say, you're coming into a new life. He said his baptism was just a baptism of confession of sin and of repentance. It perhaps had the idea associated with washing a person clean, as many of the Jewish washings had that notion associated. But the idea of rebirth was not suggested in anything John preached or did. So I, I just don't see how anyone could think that Nicodemus would take from this statement the idea of baptism. And he doesn't say anything about baptism. Jesus didn't say anything about baptism. So this idea that being born of water and born of the Spirit means being baptized in water and baptized in the Spirit sounds to me like, I don't know, a doctrine of convenience brought up by someone who wanted to advocate the necessity of water baptism, but it doesn't sound like an exegetical idea to draw from what Jesus actually said. So it doesn't seem to be what, what uh, Nicodemus took from it, and I don't blame him. I can't see why he would. So I don't believe that Jesus is referring to baptism in water here, or baptism in the Spirit, though I believe in both. I just don't think that's what he's talking about. But what is he talking about there? Well, there's a couple, of, a couple of suggestions that make some sense to me, better sense than that one. Two other options exist. One is that baptism in water and in the spirit is one way of thinking about being born again. The, the second birth is a birth of water and of the spirit. In other words, he's, he's talking about one additional birth that you need, which is 
of water and spirit. Now, what, where would that, what would that convey? Jesus expected the teacher of Israel to know these things. So this would have to come from something in the Old Testament. Well, there is a possibility that Jesus was alluding to something in the Old Testament. In the Ezekiel 36... Uh, in Ezekiel 36, there is a passage that is uh, recognized by Christians. All Christian theologians pretty much recognize it. it's about the new birth and the new covenant. And it describes it in these terms, in verse 25 through 27. God says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Now, here, God is speaking to the prophet of what he will do when the Messiah comes and, and establishes a new covenant. In the new covenant, God will cleanse them as with sprinkling water. He will give them a new heart, take out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, uh, essentially a new life, and put his spirit in them. This could be thought of as a new birth. It's a regeneration. It's a change of heart. It's like a new life altogether. And it may be, although the word birth is not used here, that this is what Jesus expected to be, uh, un to be understood to be talking about. Because this could be called a birth of water and spirit, since it uses the term, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and I'll put my spirit in you. Both of these would be aspects of the, sec of the new birth, that there's a cleansing as with the sprinkling of water. It's a figure of speech. It's not talking about the literal baptism of water. It is talking more about the concept that the Jews had, that you sprinkle things, the sacred things, to make them holy. Uh, and almost like the, uh, you know, a little bit like what the Catholics do with sprinkling holy water. I think uh, there was a sprinkling of blood and sprinkling of water in some of the ceremonies that the Jews had. Uh, and the idea that I will sprinkle water upon you and make you clean is uh, a reference to forgiving sins, justification, and then I'll put my spirit in you. Now, that would be something perhaps that Paul is alluding to in Titus chapter uh, 3, I believe it is. I'll tell you if I'm right in a moment. Here. Yeah. Titus 3, verse 5. Taking up uh, Paul mid-sentence, as is sometimes necessary to do since his sentences run many verses long, including this one. But in the midst of the sentence, in verse 5, he says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration. Not of baptism, but of regeneration. That's the changed heart. The new heart is what regeneration is talking about. The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. See, there's water and the Spirit. We were saved through being regenerated, likened to washing, perhaps because of Ezekiel 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. And I'll put my spirit in you. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Cleansing from sin and renewing of the life by giving a new spirit and a new heart. Paul speaks of being saved in that manner. That could be Paul's way of alluding to being born of water and of the spirit. And also alluding, of course, to the Ezekiel passage. So this is a, a, a reasonable interpretation, I think, of Jesus' words. It's not the only reasonable one. I have another one I want to give you. But, but uh, certainly one way of looking at this in John 3, 5 is that Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born one more time, which is a birth of water and the Spirit, as Ezekiel alluded to, a regeneration, a new heart being given to you, a cleansing as of water, and uh, a giving to you of the Holy Spirit so that you are, as Paul put it, the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. These are the aspects of the new birth. That's a, don't you think that's a pretty good interpretation of this? I think it makes a lot of sense. 
It's not the one I hold, but I think it's a good one. Um, the third possibility is the one that I personally favor, although I'm not sure that I'm right because the one I just gave you is pretty good. But um, <clears throat> the reason I favor a third option is because of what Jesus said after that. Because he was not finished speaking in verse 5, he went on to verse 6. For he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now notice verses 5 and 6 in juxtaposition. Both of them speak of two things. The first one is born of water and born of the spirit. The second one is born of the flesh and born of the spirit. There's a contrast there. In both cases, there is a birth of the spirit, but it's contrasted with something else. A birth in water or in the flesh. If born of the flesh is parallel in Jesus' mind with born of water, then born of water just means natural birth. Now, why would anyone speak of that as born of water? Well, anyone who's had a baby knows. <laughs> you young single guys may not know. Not many of you here. But, uh, of course, a baby is born amidst the breaking of waters. Uh, waters precede the birth. The waters are the signal that the birth is imminent. A uh, person who is born the first time is born, we could say, through water or up water. And that would appear in the structure of verses 5 and 6 taken together to be parallel to being born of the flesh. Now, there's no ambiguity in the word born of the flesh. Born of the flesh means born, a baby, the first time. Physically, physically born. And so it looks to me like Jesus is comparing or contrasting two kinds of birth in both verses. In the first of these two verses, verse 5, he uses the expression to contrast them born of water and of the Spirit. In the second, he uses the contrast born of flesh and of the Spirit. And that's what makes me think born of water just means natural birth. And he'd be saying then, it's not enough that you've been born once. Everyone's been born once. And it doesn't matter what your pedigree is, or what your parentage is, or what, what your race is. Because if you're just talking about being born of the flesh, you're just flesh. The kingdom of God, though, is a spiritual kingdom. And you cannot enter the kingdom unless you are spiritual. You have to be born of the spirit as well as being born of the flesh. Now, I have no emotional attachment to this third option. It's just what I have been convinced of, if you happen to think the second option, or even the first one, makes more sense. You're welcome to it. The main point is that he is saying there's an additional birth, a supernatural birth that is spiritual, which if a person does not have, they will not see or enter the kingdom of God. The fact that they can't see it suggests that it's only perceived spiritually. You remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.14. He said, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritual things have to be discerned by spiritual people. Natural men can't see them, can't discern them. And so, if the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, then it cannot be discerned by natural men. One must be a spiritual man to discern spiritual things, and you must be born of the Spirit. So, that appears, to, well, that is certainly what Jesus is saying, regardless of what he means by born of water, because you could take, you could take uh, the second or the third option there, and it would still be the same idea. The idea is that you've been born once already, you need to be born uh, again. And that needs to be a spiritual birth, uh, uh, born of the Spirit. In verse 7, he says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Why would you be surprised about that? You should be aware that, you know, your ancestors, Israel, they had a perfect pedigree in many cases, but they had a very imperfect history in that they turned from God again and again and again. Being born Jewish was not enough to make a man loyal to God. There must be something different required, a different kind of heart, a removal of the heart of stone, the insertion of a heart of flesh, the writing of God's laws on the heart instead of on stone tablets imposed on the outward behavior. There has to be a change inwardly. It has to be a spiritual thing. That's why God said, I will give you 
I'll put my spirit within you and make you walk in my way. So in other words, I'll change your orientation from being a rebel to being a son, an obedient son. You'll have to be born of me to be my son. I'll give you my spirit, and uh, that's, that's a spiritual thing. Jesus thought that Nicodemus should have put two and two together and come up with that. Jesus said in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, the word wind in the Greek is the same as the word spirit. The same is true in the Old Testament Hebrew. In the Old Testament, the word is ruach. It means spirit or wind or breath. It can be translated any of those ways, depending on the demands of the context. The word pneuma or pneuma has a silent p at the beginning. That's the Greek word here. And it's just like the word ruach. It can be breath. It can be spirit. It can be wind. Our translators here have translated the wind blows where it wishes. Some people prefer the spirit blows where it wishes. But I think wind is better. Because Jesus is giving an illustration at the end of which he says, so are those who are born of the Spirit. There's something in nature that resembles something in the Spirit. That which is in nature is the wind. He said the wind, uh, it's not under your control. It, it blows freely around wherever it wants to. You can't control the wind. Uh, Donovan sang a whole song about that. Might as well try and catch the wind. You can't do that. It's going to go where it wants to go. And he says, you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. Now, he says, so are those who are born of the Spirit. Some people say, that means that when people are born of the Spirit, you can't tell where they came from or where they're going. And uh, that's because that's how it is, like the wind. But I don't think that's the comparison. What I think he's saying is, the wind is a mysterious force. It kind of acts without your permission. It goes where it wants to go. You don't really understand it at all. You don't know where it begins, where it ends. It's a mystery to you. It's even in invisible to you. Although you can see and hear its effects. So also, this phenomenon of being born of the Spirit, he says, it, you, you can't hope to understand it. You might as well try and catch the wind. And so... The wind is something invisible, but of course you, you believe in it. You, you don't see it, but you see the effects it has on the trees and, the, and the, everything else. And you feel it on your face and hear it howl. You know it's there, not because you see it, but because you see what it does. And so also the moving of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. You can't see the Spirit. The, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. You can't say, lo here or Lord, is there... It's within you. It's, it's among you. It's something that is spiritual. You can tell that it's come, though, because just like the wind, which, which affects things in ways that you can see and hear, so one who is born of the Spirit, the Spirit affects people in ways that you can see and hear. There's, there's tangible evidence of the reality of being born of the Spirit, though it's mysterious, like the wind is mysterious. I think that's what he's saying. Verse 9. Nicodemus speaks again after so long a time. He's not doing much of the talking, but he's doing some questioning. And Jesus then answers the questions. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Now, it, it's not clear whether this is a rhetorical question saying, this can't be. Sometimes you say, how can this be? You're not really asking for an answer. You just, you're basically, it's a rhetorical question. In, you know, in fact, he's saying, this is impossible. But Jesus answers it as if it's a true question, and maybe it was. How can someone be born again then? How can it be that someone experiences rebirth? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Now, who is we? Some people might think it's Jesus and the Holy Spirit, or Jesus and the Father. But in all likelihood, he means himself and John the Baptist. He talks about we testify to what we have seen and what we know. If you look back two chapters, we have John the Baptist speaking. And he said in verse 33, 
of Jesus, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now John has said, I've seen, I know, and I testify, I bear witness. And that's what Jesus says, we bear witness to what we have seen and what we know. John bore witness to what he saw and what he knew, and Jesus bore witness to what he saw and what he knew. And I think he's saying, you've heard of John, and now you've heard of me, and we're both talking about things we know about. We've seen what you haven't seen. We know things you don't know, and we're bearing witness to them. So it's just for you to decide whether you believe our witness or not. And he says, you don't receive our witness. Now, I don't know if you, I, it's plural, I don't know if he means you know, Nicodemus and his friends, or you Jews in general. I don't know if Jesus is making a statement about Israel as a whole, which uh, might allow a few, like Nicodemus, to be exceptions to, or, or whether mm -hmm. he's uh, you know, implicating Nicodemus himself and people who are maybe uh, in a shallow way showing interest in him. He said, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And this is not, it's not obvious what he means by this, but he might be saying, I've just told you uh, something for which I can give an earthly analogy. Birth is an earthly analogy for what I'm talking about. The wind is in some sense an earthly analogy. These are earthly things I can, if I'm telling you things that I can give earthly analogies for, what, and that you don't understand still, what if I want to talk about things that there is no earthly analogy for? What kinds of things might there not be an earthly analogy for? I sometimes think maybe the Trinity is one of those things. I'm not sure, I don't think he's necessarily referring to that, but there were mysteries yet to come for which no earthly analogy could be found. And every time teachers try to give an earthly analogy, including me, it's very evident of the inadequacy of the analogy. Because the Father's the Holy Spirit, the way that they are persons and one God and so forth, there's just no explanation given in the Bible. Never likened to anything earthly. It's teachers who are not satisfied with the mystery and have to try to come up with analogies. But there are mysteries. There are things for which no analogy can be found of earthly things. He said, you're having trouble with the things that I can illustrate from earthly examples. Uh, what are you going to do if I go beyond that? You're going to be in bad shape. He says in verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, and in the New King James, and the King James says, who is in heaven. That's an awkward phrase to have there. And it is absent from the Alexandrian text. So if you have a translation other than the King James or the New King James, it probably doesn't have that last clause, who is in heaven. And that may be because it doesn't belong there, or it might be that the people who came up with the Alexandrian text found it as difficult as I do, and thought, let's just let's leave that out. Why is it difficult? Because Jesus is speaking in this place on earth. And he speaks of himself. And he speaks of himself as one who is in heaven. Now, of course, if verse 13 is not Jesus speaking, but is a parenthesis of the author inserting a comment, which is not unheard of. From time to time, there's a quotation of Jesus speaking, and then the author gives a little commentary. I realize that in our Bible, verse 13 is within the quotation marks as if Jesus is still speaking, but there are no quotation marks in the Greek. The Greek doesn't have any punctuation, and therefore the punctuation in your Bible is the translator's best guess. And the translators apparently have uh, kept the, the conversation going with Jesus speaking all the way up through verse 21. I don't think that Jesus was speaking all the way through verse 21. No one knows for sure because there are no quotation marks in the Greek. But I think Jesus stopped at some place prior to that. I think he probably stopped no later than verse 15. But possibly even at verse 12. If verse 12 is the close of Jesus' remarks, where he ends you know, a little bit scolding Nicodemus for being dull, and we don't have any further quotation from Jesus at this point. And then John does what he often does and goes off and gives his own commentary. Then John might be saying, 
in verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of God, or Son of Man who is in heaven. At the time John is writing, Jesus has gone back to heaven. Of course, John didn't write this book until long after the ascension. So he could, he could be making a comment like this, that Jesus, the one I'm telling you about, is now in heaven. And that would solve the problem. There's really nothing else after verse 12 that would have to be said by Jesus in this setting. It, it, it all could be the author, and, and so that's a possibility. Another possibility is that Jesus is still speaking, and that last clause was not originally there. Because the Alexandrian text leaves it out. It just ends verse 13 with, uh, except the Son of Man, period. Of course, if that's how the original ended, one has to come up with a theory about how this last clause got added when it's so awkward. In many cases where there's a textual difference, the more awkward reading is probably the authentic one. Because no one would take an easier reading and make it more awkward. <laughs> but someone might take an awkward reading and make it more easy. So in many cases, you know, if you've got two readings and one is strange and one is not strange, as much as we'd like to go with the one that's not strange, we would have to explain, well then how is it that if it was originally not strange, who was crazy enough to add this strange part to it when it didn't need it, didn't improve it. Uh, and so this is an unsolved mystery about this. Many times textual question, questions cannot be resolved because there's people who favor this or that text. And, and all I can say is uh, if John wrote, was making his comments here, there's not a problem with it. So maybe the quotation from Jesus ends at verse 12. But John goes on. But uh, if he does... We're going to have to take what he says on another occasion because it's gotten too late for us to continue. And uh, so we'll stop here at verse 12. And when we come back, we will proceed as if we're reading John's commentary on all this.